Today, 10 things every reefer should know about setting up reef tank lighting. Uh, what we wish somebody had told us day one. All right, the first step in getting this thing mounted light is the mission, which is fourfold. We're gonna blanket the tank in hard to shadow light. We're gonna get the par right with the schedule, and then we're going to have the confidence that we did it right so we can just leave it alone. Let's do it. Number two, decide how you're going to mount your light. And this can be confusing for beginners, so let's make it really easy. If your light has mounting arms or legs, just use them. They're easy and they should already be near the ideal height. Okay, uh, it's not always true that they're the right <laughs> ideal height, but uh, if you're buying it from anybody reputable, the mounting height of the arms is actually designed to the light, so it should be. Uh, so I think a vast, vast majority of people, if you're trying to figure out how to mount it, and it comes with a mounting kit that's designed either in the box or is optional, you'll probably use that. Number three, mounting to the ceiling is one of the rarest ways to mount it, but it's actually one of the best as well. I know it can be a little intimidating, so here's a couple tips for you. Centering is the most difficult part because you get it up there and then it's just barely off and it's gonna bug you forever. So one really simple trick here is just use a string and tie a washer to it. You know, hold it up at the ceiling and you'll see exactly where that washer sits. Then you can just take a pencil and mark the center, done. To actually mount that to the ceiling, there are a couple ways to do it. One, if you just have some drywall up there and there's no stud nearby, use some toggle bolts. Really easy way to do it, but if you wanna be extra sure and it's in those studs, but there's no stud right there, all you need to do is just take a piece of wood. It can be a two by four, whatever you want. You know, Find the studs, drill it into the studs, and then paint it to match your ceilings and just hang it from there. Uh, so I will tell you, I did this for my first time on my first tank. Uh, I got sick of the little legs that were breaking <laughs> off of my little Coralife fixture. Uh, and ultimately I replaced it with a T5 fixture that really only had the option to hang it from the ceiling. Intimidating at first until somebody in the local club told me to do this. Just take a piece of tape and then tape where you have the holes on your tank uh, intersection. Uh, and then go up to the ceiling and hang that piece of string until the like washer at the end of it is centered right over yeah. the pieces of tape, and now it's perfect. I was terrified but prior to that, <laughs> like how am I ever gonna measure this right that it doesn't end up looking wonky and uh, set up my OCD? After I did, it was really easy. I use a little toggle bolts, drill hole, and they snap open. Mm -hmm. I mean, they hold a lot of weight, so the typical light that we're using is an issue. No. Uh, you, could, you could do the plywood method if you wanted to to really secure it. But here's the thing that's really cool. Why, like, even though, you know, some, obviously some of you don't want to go through this effort. What's really, really cool about it is now when I need to get in there, I don't have to like take these lights off yes. or do anything, especially if I had a big fixture. I just pull the little line mm -hmm. on uh, the cable and it goes zoop and it zips out right out of the way. I can get in there and then when I'm done, I push a little button and it slides right back down to where I wanted it. It's one of the best ways long term because it gives you really easy access to the tank, especially on big fixtures. Number four, there's actually wall and tank brackets out there that you can choose to mount to, many of which uh, may be tied to a brand, but can be used for other brands if you want as well. Uh, starting with the Aquatic Life floating suspension system. So what that does is you bolt a little bar to your wall uh, and then it has a cable that comes out and like, you know, hangs it like a yeah, suspension cool. bridge. Yeah. And now I have the ability to have that cool suspension that I can lift in it and take it on and off the tank or raise it, but it's attached to the wall. Another option like that is a uh, Kessel's uh, option where you can like bolt it right into the stand and then the arms come yes. out and, and over. So really strong options. There's also options that go into the wall for that. Uh, even AI has the H HMS system for something similar to that as well. So uh, you can mount it to the stand, have arms that come out, you can have mounted to the wall. There's all kinds of cool options for the brackets as well. Number five, how high should I mount this light? It's a really great question. Well, you can watch our positioning of light video. It's long, it has like 50 lights in there, but they're each timestamp. So you can find the exact light that you have. Mounting height really matters when you're talking about a small fixture. I mean, there's not a big window there where it's working at its best. It matters less definitely when you have a larger fixture. 
Yeah, so mounting height matters for this reason. If I have a little small module, it's basically got like a cone of light coming out of it. So if I mounted it fairly high, you know, it's got a cone that covers the whole space. But if I mounted it too close, well, that cone is now creating like a laser beam, yeah. you know? So instead of like having a whole bunch of points that are 100 par, I got a whole bunch of points right in the center that are 1,000 par. Uh, and, and I'm just gonna burn and kill everything. Uh, and so that's why when you have a smaller one, it's really, really important to get that mounting height right. And what we're doing in the positioning of light video, so go watch that when you're uh, doing this, is you can find either your light or something like it because there's you know 50 of them and it's covering <laughs> over a two foot area, which is a pretty common space. You can kind of take a guesstimate uh, if it changes out that. But what we're really looking for is a balance of let's get even spread across the top without spilling too much light into the room. And the answer is the intersection where we don't do neither of those absolutely perfect, <laughs> man, but we do both of them really, really well. That seems to be the intersection where we're going for it. So go watch that. If you don't uh, have that available to you, obviously a PAR meter is right. Yeah. And if you don't have a PAR meter and this doesn't exist for you, literally just lifting the light up and looking at how much light goes into the room and how it's kind of spreading out in the tank. And if you don't even want to do that, most of the lights out there, I will say, fit pretty well inside of like a, you know, seven to eight inch window, you know, a couple of them a little lower, a couple a little higher, but seven to eight inches is pretty safe unless you see those little lenses on there. If yep. you see those little commodity, like white lenses on there, uh, most of the time, and you're looking at like 20 inches, this thing is a focused lens designed to shoot way, way, way down. So if you see those little lenses, mount it high. Everything else, uh, in any case, so you can see the importance of actually getting this right. Number six, what about spectrum settings? All those switches, all those individual lights, how can we get it right? Well, using a preset is going to be way better than just individually flipping switches and changing each individual light. Remember a few key facts here. Blue is for your coral growth. White gives a lot of beautiful colors. Green will actually make things look brighter. And red, well, that's for the trailblazers out there. You can have all of these change throughout the day, but you're more likely to mess things up. So keep it the same. Yeah, I mean, that's a big question is like, should I have a different setting for the morning and the evening? And the answer is you can, uh, but uh, really the coral has to like adapt to those changes. So the less the coral has to adapt, the better. So if you actually did have largely the same spectrum throughout the day, you'll probably have more success than not. And it's not that you can't have different ones, it's that it's just a little bit of the Wild West now because everybody's just kind of like guessing. <laughs> uh, and I guess what I would say is those presets that come in there or for people who just want to plug it in the wall and have it work, pick the preset, like with the Radeon, there's the AB, AB plus, yep. you know, this is like proven out inside of farms and stuff. Uh, and just use that. Uh, and then if you are the type of person where, you know what, I don't want to actually just plug it in the wall and have it work, then I'm going to actually willing to risk the fact that it might not work as well to achieve like a very specific mm -hmm. desire. And you better know what that desire is because this <laughs> is not for your eyes. This is to support biology for an animal, right? That survive needs this light and these ratios to you know survive, or it will have to adapt to the new ones that you create. So the spectrum settings, use the preset in a vast, vast majority of cases, and then just leave it alone, and that will produce the best results. One more time, leave it alone. <laughs> Every time that you switch it, expect things to get worse, not better. Number seven, what about par? use a par meter. There's actually one that's right around $200 and it's a great option for anybody with a laptop or if your computer is actually relatively close because the cord on that thing's pretty long. It's the first one I used and it works absolutely fantastic. Otherwise, you can just buy one from us and then you can use it for up to 60 days, I believe, and then you can return it. And remember, the baseline you're going for here, if you have an LPS tank, we usually shoot for around 50 to 150 par, and then for SPS is 200 to 350 par, and more is definitely not better here. The important part here is uh, the eye can't see this. This isn't something you're gonna tune to brightness because your eye perceives green as brightness. Uh, and uh, it's the, like registers or brightness at like, a, like 10 times as much as blue. So if you turn off all of the like white lights, 
and only the blues on, it's gonna look super dim, but it's probably really high par anyway. You really can't just see this with the eye. Uh, we've done actually did an expert uh, uh, investigates on this. Go watch it. It's pretty compelling. Uh, <laughs> but in any case, uh, you know, again, you said that this one right here plugs in your laptop. Uh, I would prefer to have the laptop near me so I can actually see it. Uh, but uh, 200 bucks, you now have a par meter. Uh, there are, however, sometimes where a standalone unit is just better. It's easier. Uh, yeah. I got the little wand for this. I can read it in real time, whatever. And better yet, uh, these uh, options right here. These options, uh, we do this as a service for all of you guys because you're gonna pick up these lights. I would, I would tell you, almost like probably like 92 out of 100 times, if I gave somebody an $800 light and a $200 par meter, or I gave somebody a $1,500 light and I have no par meter and asked which one was more successful down the road, for sure the $800 person with the par Absolutely. meter. Like 93 <laughs> out of 100 times, it'll probably be true. Uh, and so, because we're tuning it to the organism, uh, what it needs and what it thrives on. Now that par meter though, again, is that big one, like just use it. Like you can buy it, use it for up to two months. Let your buddy use it, like loan it to your club, do whatever you want to do it with it. And then in two months, you can actually return it within 60 days for just a small restocking fee. Uh, this is just a service because we want to help you get it right. Number eight, we've got the spectrum down, we got the par down, but what about photo period? We found that about eight hours is the sweet spot. Now, if you want a little bit more time to look at your tank, then you can always extend that at the beginning or, or at the end, but make sure when you do that it's at a fraction of the par. Uh, the reality is, uh, is eight hours is just a safe spot, yeah. right? Some people will go a little longer. Some people may even go a little shorter at peak. Uh, but the reality is, is what you're doing is kind of like counting photons here. Uh, so, you know, if uh, I got 300 par, there's a certain amount of photons going there and it's eight hours. But if I had only 200 par, I might actually be able to get the same amount of photons if it went 12 hours, yeah. right? The answer is like, we don't know yet the equation there, but we do know that eight hours seems to be the area where a lot of people are really, really, really successful or like almost everybody. That won't be the reason that you fail. Now, let's say you want to go beyond that. You want to just mm -hmm. get into that DLI okay, cool. question, which is uh, like, how, how intense and for how long, alkalinity is your answer. So don't just like wing it and look at it and say, <laughs> ah, I'm gonna try nine hours tomorrow. Uh, do try nine hours, but like get a daily measurement of alkalinity Smart. every day, right? And then uh, my tank's consuming about this much every day. And then I crank up the lights. And if I'm doing something good for the tank, like extending it another hour, well, in that case, I should probably see the alkalinity drop because it's yeah. consuming more. It's telling me, hey, yeah, I appreciated that extra energy. I'm gonna reward you with more growth. But if it actually <laughs> does the opposite, like say I crank my lights up uh, 20% and go from like, uh, you know, 275 par and I really wanna push the limits and I'm going above 350 or something. Well, if all of a sudden the levels in your tank go up, it means the corals aren't sucking it up as fast as they used to, which means you're hurting biology. So that's the nerdy end of the photo period. If you just wanna know that you did it right, eight hours is that safe, sweet spot. Number nine, leave it alone. I'm gonna say it again, leave it alone. Somebody who toys with it, who tinkers with it, is probably what, 10, 20 times more likely to do harm to the corals than to actually help them. I mean, I mean it, I mean it. Leave it alone, don't mess with it anymore. It's really not a toy. Yeah, it is not a toy. Lighting junkies just have a fraction of the success of those that do it well the first time and then have the confidence that they did it well, regardless of like some bumps they might see, they'll know, no, I got this lighting thing covered, I did it right, and then leave it alone. Those people will be so much more successful <laughs> than the people that are like trying to constantly adjust things to fix something they didn't know. So find the confidence, understand what you're trying to achieve, do it to the best of your ability and leave it alone. That is where the best tanks come from. Number 10, let's say you set it up, you did it wrong because you didn't watch any of our videos. You can make a change, but only do it when you know you've made a mistake. But when you make that change, you need to make sure you plan it out really well. The change needs to happen slowly and your change needs to be good for at least two years. You need to make a change that's going to be permanent and you're not going to touch it again. Uh, I would go even further than this. I would say, like, unless the tank is actually suffering in some way, 
clearly the biology is not being yeah. served. Like, because if everything's going well, uh, sometimes you can do less than perfect and it'll still yeah, go well. It, yeah. Okay, but like now that you know what you need to know, if you're like, you know what, man, this is going to go south for me. I don't actually have to wait for it to go south. So like, for instance, this is really common with SPS uh, owners is like, uh, well, I put in these little modules everywhere and I don't know, they seem to be doing really fine. My little frags are growing. It is absolutely true that growing this little teeny frag is totally different than growing a colony yeah. that shades itself and its neighbors. And at some point you're going to have to add in the fill light. So, well, you know what though? Like, what am I going to do? Wait until like the things <laughs> like visually losing tissue uh, and that unhealthy, or I'm seeing these signs. Why can't I just do it right from the beginning and skip all of that and let it thrive? My number one takeaway from today is for beginners, setting up a new light can actually be incredibly daunting. So my best piece of advice for you is choose a route, research it, watch our videos and stick with it. If you know that there's a light you like or a method you wanna go, select it, research. We have so many videos on this topic, follow our advice, don't touch it, you'll find success. Uh, my takeaway on this is do it right the first time. And if it's working, don't mess with it. So what's next? Well, basically where all that counsel comes from, which is it's time to learn the decades of our lighting <laughs> mistakes and pitfalls so that you can actually get it right the first time, not have to learn the hard way like we have. And all of our best of lighting playlists right here.